Yes, hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy and I'm here alongside my great friend Joe Stanley. Welcome, Joe. Oh, Darcy, it's great to be here on a gorgeous autumn day. The leaves are falling, there's a slight chill in the air. I just love this time of year. Yeah, I like this time of year as well. Plus, the outside world is slowly beginning to open up to us, which is making us all feel pretty optimistic about coming out the other side of all this, Joe. Yes, and today we'll be riding that wave of optimism as we check out a unique gardening program that's helping young Australians with special needs bloom in every way. And Gus Warren is still on his fitness challenge, so I'm keen to see how he's doing. Plus, our resident doctors cough up some facts on coughs. And something that I'm looking forward to, Darcy, is sharing what a walk in the park is like with our Labrador, Daisy which is not a walk in the park, <laughs> let me tell you. I've seen you with Daisy and our dog Dennis gets a good look in it as well. It's all about acknowledging the RSPCA's Million Paws Walk, a great event which fights animal cruelty and has morphed into something else this year. It's when all the dogs in Melbourne get to take their owners for a walk. Right now, though, the race is on all around the world to develop a COVID-19 vaccine. The actual virus is being held in a medically secure laboratory at the CSIRO in Geelong, where scientists are now working on two potential vaccines. I spoke with the CSIRO's Director of Health and Biosecurity, Dr Rob Grenfell, for the latest updates on the trials. So I understand that the Doherty Institute was able to replicate the virus from a Chinese patient uh, and then it was transferred to your facility in Geelong. How is it now managed in your laboratory? The facility at Geelong is uh, one of five unique uh, facilities globally. So. It's essentially like a box in a box in a box. Nothing comes out of that central box once it's placed in there. And in fact, even the people working in there are really actually not in there because they're wearing spacesuits, um, which are in fact uh, protecting them completely from that environment. So the air and everything else that's actually in that laboratory is destroyed um, so that it actually can't get out. Wow, that's something like a, a science fiction. So what is the timeline on the project that you're working on towards this vaccine? Well, the, the most important thing to stress with when, when you're making a vaccine is that it's a global effort because no single facility actually could do this on their own from start to finish because it's actually very complex and requires very focused and specific skills along each step. So the step we're involved in is what's called the preclinical testing, which by merits of it is it's actually testing on animals. So uh, the animal model we're using is a ferret model. Ferrets have a particular um, enzyme or at least protein in the lining cells of their lungs that's very, very similar to humans. That's the ACE2 receptor, which is what the virus binds to. So if we can find a vaccine that stops the virus binding to that receptor, um, this actually means that it'll almost certainly work in humans. So how long does your testing take and is there a timeline that you can, can share with us? To get to the stage of, uh, of, of the preclinical testing or validating the preclinical testing usually takes one to two years. We're actually expecting that we will be done uh, with this, oh, I reckon, around about the end of June, but we'll have provisional results before then. So we've really accelerated what's going on. That is really extraordinary and exciting, although obviously around the world we all feel like it can't come soon enough. So you speak of all of the different people and, and organisations around the world who are all working feverishly to try and find a vaccine. Is that unusual for organisations to work together? Look, uh, generally in, uh, in, in medical research, there's ferocious competition about people uh, uh, trying to achieve certain results and others. What's been overwhelming here is the incredible sharing and even more importantly, whilst a lot of people have been sceptical of what China's been giving us or not giving us, on the science side, they have been amazing. They've, they've uh, certainly allowed us uh, information at the very, very early stages of the genomic makeup of the virus, the protein structures of the virus, and also ways to grow the virus and how they actually grew it. Can I tell you, as someone, and I think we're all the same, we're at home feeling quite anxious about this, it really is very encouraging to me and quite calming to know that the world's greatest minds are working together 
to solve this problem. So what is our best hope? When do you think we'll be able to queue up our pharmacy and get a jab for coronavirus? If everything goes well and if a number of these potential vaccines in fact actually uh, are shown to work and be safe, we may find ourselves getting a Christmas present, so to speak, with a vaccine. That would be fantastic. In the first quarter of next year, um, that would be a, a, a bit of a longer stretch. But again, we've got a lot of technical challenges that we're focusing even just in the bit that we're doing and that are on the road to making this vaccine. But let's be positive and let's look at uh, 2021 as being the great year. Well, that was a fascinating chat, Joe. no doubt about that. It's a remarkable time that we're living in. Yeah, the federal government reckon it'll be at least 10 months before a COVID-19 vaccine is developed for widespread use. But in the meantime, Dust, what a job we've done flattening the curve. I'm so proud of us. Many states and territories are going days with zero or just a few new cases each day. How awesome. Yeah, good result, Joe. And after the break, our resident GPs, the cars, are here to cover that niggling tickle in the throat, our coughs. That's coming up next on the House of Wellness. Welcome back. There's been a lot of changes in our lives over the past months, but one of the things I've noticed is that all of a sudden, I'm feeling very self-conscious if I cough or sneeze out in public these days, Joe. Oh, my husband cleared a street. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sneezing, I'm telling you. And when you know how far a sneeze or a cough can travel, you understand, because a cough can spread droplets as far as six metres and sneezing up to eight metres. Well, Joe, not all coughs mean we're sick. Sometimes it's as simple as clearing your throat or you've got a bit of dust in there or something. So here to clear up your coughing questions are our resident father and daughter medicos, the doctor's car. Hi and welcome to Medicine Past, Present and Future. My name's Dr Nick and I'm the past. And my name's Dr Isabel and I'm the future. And together we're, we're the, the present. present. Now Dr Isabel, you know that thing when you're in the movie theatre, mm. lights are going down, all goes quiet and all of a sudden you get that tickle in your throat oh, and you just feeling. have to cough. Mm. Maybe that bit of popcorn's got stuck in there or something. What's going on? What's cough all about? Yeah. It's our body's mechanism at protecting our lungs. Our lungs are these very, very delicate structures. And when we cough, it's a reflex that we use to stop anything getting down into our lungs. Now, doctors are always talking about wet coughs and dry coughs. What are we talking about here? It's exactly how it sounds. A dry cough is when you're coughing and nothing's coming up. It's very dry. A wet cough is when you're producing a lot of what we call sputum. Oh, sputum. That's just a medical word for spit, isn't it? It is a medical word for spit, yes. <laughs> and doctors get very excited about the colour of sputum. Why are we so interested in the colour of your spit? That's right. Even the other day, we were all crowding around some poor gentleman who we'd asked to cough into a cup. We were all looking at the colour of it. But I should be asking you that question, Dr Nick. If it's yellow, if it's green, do we care? Doctors often misunderstand this. They think that the colour of spit tells you that someone must have antibiotic. This isn't actually the case. You can have kids with green snot, you can be coughing up lots of green phlegm. It doesn't necessarily mean antibiotics. But there is something that you can cough up that really matters, and that's blood. Now, Dr Isabel, I know that you're a fan of the period costume drama. Ah, uh, yes, I love Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> right. So, you know in those shows where the heroine, and it's usually the woman for some reason, the heroine is suddenly coughing and it's a really bad sign. What's going on? I think you're referring to the scene, Dr Nick, where she'll start coughing into a white handkerchief and when she pulls the handkerchief away, there'll be blood in the handkerchief. And then within a few scenes, that heroine is likely to be diagnosed with something called consumption. Consumption, which was the old word for tuberculosis tuberculosis or TB. That's right, and it was called consumption because people used to cough and cough and cough and they would cough so much that they literally wasted away from this illness. They were consumed by it. And Jane Austen, who wrote your favourite show, Pride <laughs> and Prejudice, she herself died of tuberculosis of the adrenal gland. That's right. But there's another thing that blood in the sputum means these days. It can still be in tuberculosis, but there's another thing. What do we worry about nowadays? So when we see someone with blood in the sputum, the thing we get most worried about is cancer, especially if that person happens to be a smoker. So if you are a smoker and want to think about giving up, don't hesitate to go and talk to your doctor or pharmacist about things that might help. And think about calling the quit line because they can be really helpful too. 
and most coughs these days are just caused by viruses. And the best way of treating a tickly cough for a virus is actually the same way when you're in that theatre with the popcorn that's like just a soothing drink. So you can have some honey and lemon, you can have a chamomile tea, you add a little bit of whiskey to it if you like, <laughs> make a hot toddy. But the soothing drink is really all that we need for a tickly cough. Thank you, Dr Nick. And thank you, Dr Isabel. Now, Joe, here's an interesting fact, or at least I think so anyway. Our sinuses make more than a litre of mucus a day. How's that? It's a bit much for me to handle, <laughs> I've got to say. Mucus, though, as gross as it sounds, it protects the body from viruses and bacteria and super important to keeping us healthy. Like gut health and poo, it can tell us so much about our health. Well, Joe, from a crucial bodily fluid to an essential micronutrient, we often hear Heinze talk about magnesium, Joe. Oh, he's a big fan, Dars. So much so, he's fired up nutritionist Zoe Bingley Pullen in a magnesium smoothie blend off to see who's got the best tasting magnesium mixer. Zoe, it is so good to be in the kitchen with you here today, but we are separated, not just because of social distancing <laughs> regulations, but we are about to embark on the ultimate challenge. Mm who can make the best post-workout smoothie. Well, look, you know how much I love you, but in this case, I'm quite happy for you to keep your distance because I don't want you trying to sabotage my beautiful beverage. I am a massive fan of foods that are all nutrient-dense and good for us, and I'm using baby spinach in my smoothie. It's one of my favourite ingredients. It's so versatile, sweet or savoury, but it's packed full of magnesium, which, as you and I know, is great for your muscles. We are so on the same page, <laughs> ZBP. I'm also focusing on magnesium in the form of raspberries. Magnesium is one of the most abundant minerals in the human body, and it's involved in over 600 enzymatic reactions. Magnesium can help us in our day-to-day -day lives because hopefully we're all exercising, so it's certainly going to help our recovery from exercise, which will then encourage our ongoing commitment to our exercise goals. I want to hear a little bit about, you know, what is it you're doing at home exercise-wise? All right, so I'm definitely keeping it simple. I'm going back to basics. I am doing squats, lunges okay. and push-ups. Now, I'll tell you what, they use all of the muscles in my body, they burn lots of energy and they make me crave this smoothie. It is so, so good. Now, I love Pilates. I'm someone who's always done reformer Pilates, but obviously I can't go there right now. So I'm at home doing mat Pilates. All I can say, it is so much harder. <laughs> We're both really, really active and it's so important at this point in time to keep moving, especially with so much time spent at home. Now, speaking of moving, it is time to get blitzing. Magnesium helps people who are exercising a lot by two main ways. Firstly, it counteracts calcium, which would otherwise cause the muscle to contract, maybe spasm, and be quite sore after exercise. The second way is that magnesium helps to clear lactate from the muscles. Lactate is what contributes to fatigue and delayed onset muscle soreness, or DOMS, which is that feeling of soreness that we often get after exercise and more particularly um, high intensity or high impact sessions. This looks absolutely perfect, Zoe. Now, as much as I love that we've celebrated baby spinach and raspberries today, the good thing about finding magnesium is that our post-workout smoothie can be really versatile. Things like avocado, frozen banana, and my favourite, raw cacao powder. We can get magnesium from the diet, but most people find that it's either tricky to obtain enough of the magnesium-rich foods or they're needing more than they could possibly eat. So that's when they can definitely look to supplementing their diet with a magnesium supplement. Oh my God, come on, that <laughs> can't be good for you. That is unbelievable. It is, now I wanna try yours. All right, take my green goddess. Yeah, it looks very <laughs> healthy. <laughs> I've got to give it to you. My muscles are already feeling thankful for this. <laughs>Welcome back. Around one in five Australians has some kind of temporary or permanent disability which restricts everyday activities, Joe. And it also produces challenges when it comes to work and education. The unemployment rate for people with special needs is still nearly double that of people without a disability. There's definitely still a lot of work to be done in this area, Joe, but one Melbourne group is leading the charge when it comes to helping young adults develop new skills along with greater confidence and teamwork. 
Oh, today is nice day, and it, it, it's a fairly one to graze. I think we'll go and work down in the front corner over that side. When special needs teacher Sue Laird was asked to teach a gardening class in Melbourne, she had no idea what this small project would grow into. At the beginning, pretty much none of the students would look anybody in the eye. They certainly wouldn't say good morning or even ask questions of, you know, how you were and about things going on in the world around them. So we weren't sure what they were able to do. We had it in our minds that we would like to perhaps establish a social enterprise where we had people with special needs going out to work, doing things mainly like sweeping and, and uh, weeding and those sorts of things. It wasn't until they landed their first big yes. project that Sue saw these budding green thumbs begin to blossom. Two years ago, we were given a project area at Kew Cemetery. That was the sister's garden. Um, welcome to the garden. And we're doing heaps of wet. As we worked with the students, we realised that there was an awful lot more potential there and they were very keen to learn. Guys, right, keep going, we're doing well. When we did the um, sister's garden at Q, it was, like, it was a lot of hard work. Like, it was an absolute paddock full of weeds everywhere. And then about a year later, we turned into a nice garden. They now do everything from propagating the plants, planting them out, maintaining them. Motion, deadheading, weed pruning. Everything that we've done, we've just watched these students blossom. Since the success of their first project, the students now lend a hand at multiple cemeteries across Melbourne. And they're loving every second. We are very happy, having a big happy team. <laughs> we all have a lot of fun. Like, we all get along with each other. Which guys are your favourite plants? In here. Uh, Lavender. Lavender. Beautiful. Yeah. I am beautiful. Stare each other up occasionally there and there. They take on new tasks with a great deal of energy and believing that they can do it. They know at the beginning that maybe they, they don't know how to do it, but they know that they can learn how to do it. And those are the skills that you have to help them develop. But they need those basic skills in order to be able to go to study or to go out to work. What you do is you cut off the outside bud first and then inside bud second day. OK. With their newfound confidence and enthusiasm for a hard day's work, a growing number of students are now studying TAFE courses and working part-time jobs. It's a bit tough. Here you go, you can hold all these ones. What? I started like at nine, finished up four. I tried to give them to Rory, here you go, that's it. I feel fantastic and I love it. There we go. Just working with these students, they are so dedicated and I think as potential employees, you know, they would be fantastic. Is that better? Well done, Sammy. This has been the most amazing experience. They're just such wonderful, wonderful young adults. It makes me want to get out of bed every morning and come and work with them. Nice and firm, one big thing, beautiful. Well done, Sammy. I love this course. The Memorial Garden Project received a Victorian Innovation Award in 2018, which is well deserved and great to get that recognition, Jo? Oh, it's such a beautiful, empowering program. Of course, the current restrictions mean the gardening program is now online, but students will be picking up their rakes and shovels and returning to the cemetery as soon as they can to get digging again. And speaking of returns, you mentioned you're keen to get in line for the hairdresser sooner rather than later, Jane. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, we're, we're all just weeks away from knowing everyone's true hair colour, but it's long gone for me. There is no hiding the truth anymore, Darth. <laughs> However, a range of easy-to-use home treatments means you can still hide your roots. Three weeks ago, I was looking in the mirror with my gym gear on and my hair up in the messy pony and, and bun that I was having every day, and I thought, oh, my gosh, what is going on with my hair? Did my roots, and it's unbelievable how just doing such a small thing like that can just change your mood completely. I was feeling like I've aged 100 years <laughs> in three weeks, and I got that colour on, and I just felt amazing afterwards. So exciting. We're going to be doing the Clairol Root Touch-Up Colour Blending Gel today. Um, we're going to be using dark brown for you, for your okay. roots, and it's yep. a super easy process, so I'm going to hand it over Thank to you. you. 
So as a hair specialist, we're hearing a lot that people aren't able to get into the salon and people are completely losing it because they're seeing the greys come through. And some people haven't actually used a, a hair colour before and there's just so many easy options out there. There's no reason why we have to stay at home with grey hair or suffer with the regrowth. We have our beautiful built-in application brush. So that's super easy to use. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So what I love about this product is it is completely mess free. We've got the tube, we've got the applicator and it's just straight onto the hair. So super easy, no mess, no fuss. You don't need to worry about covering yourself. And also it doesn't stain your hairline, which is great. This is easy. Super wow. easy. A lot of the techniques that we find um, women go for with hair colour is a balayage. That's quite popular at the moment. So similar to how my hair is now, you seem to find that there's a darker shade at the top through the roots and that blends down into lighter shades at the bottom. So we do find that that type of hairstyle does lend itself um, to be a little easier to use a root touch-up product because you can apply that colour all the way through the roots and still maintain that beautiful colour that the hairdresser has applied. So why don't we stay on that same side and lift your hair up at the back and just place a bit of that product at the back there. So our root touch-up colour blending gel is a really nice I would call it a temporary solution in terms of a hair colour care. So it'll give you 10 washes. It's a whole new world that we're living in at the moment. You know, we're not hopping on the train and going to the office for meetings. So there's little things that you can do, um, you know, just getting a little bit of colour into your hair, especially if you are getting some roots or some regrowth. Even just a blow dry and putting a tong through your hair just to kind of zhuzh yourself up for the day. It's amazing how small things like that can just set you up and give you that kind of little bit of a kick in the step for the day. You're watching the House of Wellness. Well, we've seen him battling bush tracks, pumping out push-ups and going a few rounds with the gloves on. But there isn't one challenge that our mate Gus Woolen has knocked back so far, Jo. Oh, Gus is one person that everyone wants to see win this challenge, Darcy. And so far, so good. As you say, he's been up for it from the start. And he's dropped almost 25 kilos. Now, Heinz has done a lot of work, Joe, on some of Gus's eating habits, swapping the not-so-great foods for better options, which is obviously a good thing. But this time, he's got the great man himself into the supermarket with a whole new shopping list. So shopping is something that can trick people up when it comes to transforming their health. So it's perfect that the first thing I see is berries. Yes, Mate, I am a fan of the berries. A lot of people think fruit's out yeah. these days. They're very confused. Should we be having fruit? Shouldn't we? Too much sugar, everyone says. Yeah, exactly. So uh, different levels of sugar in different types of fruit. So one of my favourite types of fruit is actually berries because they're low fructose. Stocking up on things like this. Okay hits that kind of sweet treat craving that you might get throughout the day. Yep. Packed with vitamins, fibre, really, really good for you as well. Okay, beautiful. Right. Some blackberries and we're good to go. Now there, Luke, is a fruit that I haven't had since we started this because I was told that bananas are like nature's chocolate bar and just got too much sugar. It's interesting, there's so much misinformation and fear tactics around sugar and fruit in general. So one thing I often say is make sure you look at the fructose content, so that's the main sugar that will react to your blood glucose levels. So there's about 40% fructose in a banana. Now what you're forgetting though is this is completely different to a chocolate bar because there's fibre packed with potassium, minerals. These are incredible. They're like a form of nature's superfood. But the thing with fruit, any type of fruit, is that they're a form of energy. So when someone says to me that they're having a big bowl of fruit salad for dessert, I think it's a bit of a waste because you've got all this energy and then you're going to go to bed. So utilise fruit as fuel. So have it pre or post workout. It's the best way that you can have it, really truly. Oh mate, my favourite. The collie and the broccoli. Okay, so these are two great examples of above ground low fructose vegetables packed with so much goodness when it comes to your health and they can pretty much be anything. When you look my at this... My grandma and my mum told me this. When you look at this... Shove it down, no matter what it tastes like. What do you see? I see... What do you envision on the plate? Uh, I'd love it topped up with a little bit of cheese sauce. Yeah. Salt and pepper. Yeah. With a roast. All right. Other than that... <laughs> I want you to imagine this as a pizza. <laughs> OK. 
So oh, bear, pepperoni pizza, <laughs> yum. Bear with me here. This can be a pizza base. Can it? Yep, this can be rice. Can it? Yeah, this can be cookies. Are you okay, mate? This can be bread. <laughs> <laughs> no, I swear to you, the cauliflower is so humble, yet versatile. It can be whatever you want it to be. Okay, mate. Okay, trust me, I'll Are teach you... you how to do that. Okay, no right, problem. There you go, Thank colleague. you. Colleague. Oh, so I have to take one? Yeah. Mate, it's going to sound really cheesy, but there's a saying that us health folks say, and it's called, eat the rainbow. But it's for very good reason. Okay. So obviously, fresh fruit and veggies are packed with phytonutrients, all right, which can only be found in plant foods. So with each and every meal, what you want to do is try to get as many of these different colours into your food as possible. Okay. So good healthy fats, low fructose fruits, and using fruit as a great energy source, and then as many different colours of vegetables as possible. Thank you, Daki. So this, to me, like lettuce used to be lettuce, right? Yep. Now you're looking at, I'm going, there's five, six different choice of lettuce, maybe more? Yep. So which one is the one Mate, they're all going to be so, so good for you. Okay. It's just about your taste buds, what you want to make, different flavours, colours, textures, all of that. All right, so I'm just going to sort of have a spot in the dark and say I'm going to grab one of these. There you go. Okay. Reminds me of your old haircut. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I want you to imagine you've cooked a beautiful piece of steak at home. What would you normally have with it? Barbecue sauce or HP sauce, mustard. Okay. Some description. Full of sugar, processed, refined, yeah, numbers. Apparently. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> imagine this, freshly made with real food, tomato, chilli jam, absolutely beautiful. Everything hidden here is the real deal. Real food, tastes delicious, a way better option. Okay. So when it comes to animal protein, what you want to do is have a palm size of protein in the middle of your plate, but make the hero of the rest of the space an abundance of different coloured vegetables. Right. But when it comes to anything, whether it's beef, chicken, seafood, you want to make sure that that animal has had its happiest and healthiest life. Is because when a cow has eaten a diet that it's designed to eat, which is grass, and it's lived free range, the protein of that animal is going to be way better for you because it produces a healthier omega-3 to 6 ratio, making sure that this meat is anti-inflammatory and very good for your health. Okay, beautiful. Look, I know it can be quite overwhelming when you get into this at first, but it does become second nature. But there's a few things to remember when you do this on your own. Keep your sugars really low, your healthy fats and healthy proteins nice and high, and fill your basket with an abundance of colourful vegetables. And you absolutely cannot go wrong, mate. <laughs> Can I tell you, Luke, I've learned a lot. Thanks a lot, brother. My pleasure. See Love you Love you, man. Thank you, mate. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, that was an interesting fact about the ratio of omega-3 and six in grass-fed beef, Joe. Yes, very interesting. I also love Heinz's cauliflower pizza. I'm going to give that a go. But that's not what he's cooking up in the kitchen with Gerald this week. He's got an immune system booster that's delicious and takes just minutes to make. Do you have any recipes that might enhance the function of, of our immune system across autumn and winter? I've always got your back, GQ, you know this, as does this massaged kale salad. Now, kale is a bit of a superfood in itself. I don't know if you know this, but it's actually from the cabbage family. It's packed with phytonutrients, antioxidants, and what I love in particular is the vitamin C and zinc content. Well, all of those nutrients are important, but the main two that we, you mentioned there, Heinze, is a, a vitamin C and zinc, and they each play a role in reducing our risk of catching infections, cold and flu. And if we are unlucky enough to catch that, it will help reduce some of the symptoms. Well, look, with adults catching between two to four colds per year and kids about five to 10 per year, it's really important that we understand what nutrients can actually help manage the common cold and flu. Well, our immune system works very, very hard, Heinze, particularly if we become ill with cold or flu. In fact, it works over time when we're well. Now, from our herbal ingredients, we might consider echinacea, olive leaf, and andrographis. And in supplement form, they are a great combination. But remember, always get appropriate advice from your qualified health practitioner. Too true, GQ. And of course, continue to eat plenty of superfoods like kale, which is easily added to your everyday diet. And Heinze, I have a question. Why does kale never get lonely? Why, GQ? Because it's always available in a bunch. 
Boom, boom. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> The A to Z of Vitamins is brought to you by Bioceuticals, your choice for high quality, practitioner only, therapeutic supplements from a proudly Australian company. Well, that was Heinze and GQ there showing that not all things that are green have to taste green, if you sort of know what I mean, Joe. Sure. I, I got to admit, I'm not a lover of kale. I buy it and it always goes wilted in my fridge. What's always. What's your problem with kale? I don't, do you like kale? Have you ever fried kale? Yeah, yeah, everything's better fried. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Jared will be back with no kale but lots more on immunity after the break when he answers your most pressing health questions. That's right here on The House of Wellness. Welcome back. It's getting to that time of year when the cold weather really starts to kick in and so does the common cold, Joe. Yes, and with that comes runny noses and sometimes blocked ears come to the party as well. They're just two of the things that Gerald has on his list for this week. At the moment, it's really important to focus on our immune system. And we do that by enjoying lots of fresh fruit, vegetables, whole grains, and always remember the value of a good night's sleep. Turn off all screens an hour before you're due to go to bed. Maybe read a book with a cup of tea and ensure that your bedroom doesn't have screens, is cool and dark and quiet. Winter's on the way and many of us will be confronted with a runny nose and that's annoying. But a runny nose is no more than mucus trying to drain away any irritating material that's been caught in our nose. And you can support that process by irrigating with isotonic saline. So this is salt water, specially buffered, so it doesn't irritate your nose, preferably without a preservative. And the good part is, you can really do that as often as you wish. A blocked ear is never a pleasant thing. And many of you ask how you can get rid of a blocked ear that's caused by a buildup of wax. Remember, wax does play an important role in our ear. But when it becomes plugged, please don't use a cotton bud. That can push the wax further in. There are many products available that will irrigate away, wash away that wax buildup. You can even do it in the shower. How easy is that? Of course, if symptoms persist, please consult your healthcare practitioner. Look out for each other, and most importantly, live well, be well, and stay well. Well, some great advice there from GQ, as always. And a lot of people really suffer from the cold, Joe. Some say it affects their joints, so they get more aches and pains. How do you cope with the cold? I hate it. <laughs> I hate it, which is a shame, because I have always lived in Melbourne, but I just find you hold yourself much tenser and you end up getting, you know, those aches and pains in your shoulders and neck. From... I don't mind the cold, to be honest with you. Well, there's no <laughs> doubt about putting stress on your body through exercise or physical labour is a major cause of joint pain. It can also lead to osteoarthritis, which is the most common form of arthritis. It affects millions of people worldwide. Osteoarthritis is often called a wear and tear disease because it occurs when the cartilage that cushions the bones in your joints gradually deteriorates, which is exactly what happened to one of our leading ballet soloists, Natasha Cousin. After pushing her body to its limits for years, Natasha almost had to give up dancing for good. Like many elite sports people, Natasha is solution focused and found a way to get back on her feet and back to doing what she loves most. Professional ballet dancers are considered as elite athletes. We have to bring our A-game every night. At the Australian Ballet, we do 200 plus performances a year. So it is quite demanding. Um, we train six days a week, eight hours a day. So yeah, it's full time and that's our sole focus. I guess the difficult part of being a professional ballet dancer is the sacrifices you have to make in your life. It's not just a career, it's your lifestyle. So I started dancing when I was four years old um, in Sydney. At 16 I left home, I left Australia, moved to London for three years and trained rigorously at this Royal Ballet School. When I graduated I was about 18 um, and I auditioned for the Australian Ballet Company. One of my first roles was in The Three Musketeers, the ballet, and I was a waitress <laughs> dancing with a jug. 
not glamorous at all, but I remember I just had this big grin on my face because that was my first show on stage. It's pretty amazing that we can actually move our bodies in a way that is quite abnormal. <laughs> and it takes years and years of training. Mainly it's Pilates based strength training and honing in on very particular muscles and being able to uh, train those so I can rely on them. For the performance, you're on your feet pretty much for two and a half hours and you're sweating and there's a lot of adrenaline coming through. So at the end of the show, it's really important to be able to cool down and be able to let your body recover and regenerate itself. So you can actually bounce back for the next show. Three years ago, I had this ankle injury, which is pretty much just, you know, from wear and tear and fatigue. I couldn't get rid of this inflammation in my ankle. This injury was a little bit of a pest because suddenly the pain was in the forefront of my mind all the time. Every time I took a step, did any movement, it would be almost blocking me. So what I found that worked for me for my inflammation in my ankle was this turmeric based natural alternative. It's got two components, which is turmeric betasorb and termipane, both natural ingredients that has been used for centuries in traditional Chinese medicine, in Ayurvedic practices and Western herbal medicine. So it's trialed and tested. I wanted to stick to more natural alternatives because, you know, my body is my tool and I've only got one of them, so you have to look after it. Our feet are not the prettiest <laughs> at all. <laughs> We're not, ballet dancers aren't foot models, but, you know, it's our, it's our livelihood, it's our tools and um, all the calluses and everything on our toes are there for a reason. When I go to podiatrist or um, get a pedicure, I tell them to to not <laughs> rub off or shave off any of my calluses because that's exactly I need all of those for, for my profession. <laughs>
Chi is really grounding. So when I come home to her, not only do I feel really calm, but I feel really centered and in the moment. That house will always have a dog. I can't imagine not having a dog in our house. It's just part of the fabric of the place. Having four kids it teaches them thinking about something other than themselves, and that's not easy with teenage kids. <laughs> Dogs, or all animals, are obviously in the present moment all the time. It's just living life, and I think they force you to be in that present moment in a really beautiful way, because you'll be... <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> she really hates birds. <laughs> you know, you've got to be present with them, or otherwise uh, they can do that. Just a little bit of crazy Daisy there. Now, I love getting an update for you on Daisy. She's either eating your couch, the carpet, a shoe. Yeah. What, what's the latest? Yeah, well, yeah, she has eaten our carpet. <laughs> she's 16 months old. It's time to grow out of this. I don't know what she's looking for <laughs> underneath there. Shit. But the underlay and all, gone. It hurts me. Um, what about Dennis and Chia? They definitely gave Daisy a run in the cuteness stakes. And how do you reckon Dennis Cometti goes knowing that your dog is named after him? Well, you know what? He actually, from time to time, and this happened a few weeks ago, he sends a message, how are you, how's the family, and more importantly, how's Dennis? So oh. he was quite chuffed. The, uh, the famous uh, AFL commentator, I think he was quite taken with the fact that uh, Dennis is named in his honour. That is beautiful. I have to say, Daisy has brought absolute joy to our lives and she has been a real godsend during our time staying at home, particularly with homeschooling. Our daughter Willow has no siblings, to, so to have that calming animal sleeping, she does sleep sometimes, <laughs> next to her has been beautiful. And I'm loving the fact that uh, we're out more... I'm seeing more people, as we all are, out walking their dogs out in uh, nature a lot more often. I think, if anything, the dogs have been overwalked during this time, but... <laughs> That's a good thing. Yeah. The Million Paws Walk is on for the whole of May, so you still have plenty of time to get involved. It's a great cause and a great excuse to get outside and exercise. Like we need more exercise, Darts. Yeah. Well, that's our show for today. Head to our website at houseofwellness.com.au for more information on the show. And don't forget to tune into the House of Wellness radio show every Sunday with our own Joe Stanley in GQ. Thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. Stay safe, stay well and stay home. We'll see you next time.